This is Stuart Kimball speaking for Mark Delaney. The number of asymmetrical horror games has risen dramatically over the last few years, with games such as Friday the 13th, Dead by Daylight, Evil Dead, and more giving players the chance to see the world through the eyes of both original monsters and licensed slashers. Not to mention their hapless victims. No two of these games are the same, but Gun Interactive is one of a very small number of studios to work on a second, separate franchise within the genre. For the studio, moving from the misty Camp Crystal Lake to the oppressive Texas heat is an undertaking that goes beyond setting and scenery. While some lessons can be applied directly from one game to another, a lot more don't translate so easily despite their broad strokes being similar. GameSpot recently got to go hands-on with next year's horror game and speak to the team about what it takes to bring this specific series to video games, what it's like to become a go-to team for horror adaptations, and how they ensure players appreciate playing is more than just the series mass-marketed monster. With Friday the 13th, there's one killer. With Texas Chainsaw, you're dealing with a whole family. The game plays in 4v3 matches where four victims, notably not named survivors but instead victims, awaken already ensnared by the Slaughter family that consists of the Hitchhiker, the Cook, and of course, Leatherface himself. In the 50 years since the original Tobe Hooper movie shocked audiences with its unflinching portrayals of violence, Leatherface has outgrown his own series in a way, partly due to marketing decisions, Keltner believes. As slashers blew up in the 1980s, Leatherface had become the series' mascot, its face of evil who could stand tall next to Jason Voorhees, Freddy Krueger, Michael Myers, and the rest. But the original movie was much more focused on the family as a whole. So, in being a recreation of sorts of that 1974 film, the game does this too. To match that film, you gotta have three family members running around constantly on you, making you feel uncomfortable. Might this annoy some players who really just want to be Leatherface? After playing it, I think not. Each killer has their own unique skill set, and they'll need to work together to kill off the foursome of victims and prevent anyone from escaping. Playing as two of them, I enjoyed them in different ways thanks to how they bring crucial abilities to the objective. The hitchhiker is more nimble, so he can crawl through small spaces and set reusable traps. Like bear traps made partly of bone that can be placed in front of generators the victims will be desperate to deactivate. The cook is a little slower and older, but he he can listen closely and pinpoint the survivor's locations even when they're being very quiet. Leatherface likely needs no introduction, but his intimidating chainsaw also manages to destroy obstacles that would give victims some breathing room, such as clusters of furniture in a hallway or even locked doors. There's also a fourth non-playable family character, the rocking chair bound grandpa, who villains can feed blood from victims and enjoy his sonar-like perks. The victims can sneak into his room and decommission the immobile old man. There's a difference in balancing, which is always a tricky word to talk about when you're mentioning asymmetrical horror, Keltner said. It's not supposed to be balanced, that's the definition of asymmetric, right? But when you have three villains running around, what it creates is a far more diverse gameplay and replayability. In Friday the 13th, if Jason shows up and he's a very aggressive, brutal, in-your-face player, then you kind of get an idea of how the match is going to kind of play out. Whereas in this, you may have two aggressive players and then maybe one that's playing a little more cheeky, a little bit more stealthily, or however they want to play. And that formula changes each time because it's all human-driven. We give you the tools, we give you the mechanics, the abilities to play the ways you want to play. And that makes for a rich type of gameplay that every time you reset and everyone picks different roles, you feel that it plays like a different game. This novel approach to the genre, giving the killers nearly as many players as the victims, demands victims who feel somewhat empowered as well. But because it's Texas Chainsaw Massacre, this will never be a power fantasy. On the map I played, getting off the property was the only win scenario. There are no cops to call, and Tommy Jarvis isn't going to show up with a shotgun like he does on the campgrounds of Gunn's pass effort. Each victim has their own unique ability, however, and like the killers, it's the tactical confluence of all these abilities that will lead to success. You'll need Connie's ability to instantly open locked doors, thus bypassing the skill check minigame, just as much as you'll need Leland's ability to lower his shoulder and knock villains off their feet, buying the group some time. Both killers and victims have lengthy skill trees too. It seems, though I wasn't able to explore them in detail during my hour or so with the game. As usual in this genre, the give and take of deciding when to save an ally versus when to write them off as dead weight makes the Texas Chainsaw Massacre an interesting social experiment on top of its intentions of being a creepy multiplayer game. The map is full of details that serve the gameplay for both teams without breaking the illusion that you're in a wretched, hopeless place. Gun wants players to feel like they're in the movie themselves, so the ample number of locked doors, small crevices used for sneaking, darkened corners in the grotesque basement, and fast evaporating 
using escape routes, managed to keep the house grounded in reality without it feeling too video gamey. My favorite map details are the open wells outside. The outdoor space is pretty vast on the one of three announced maps I played, but it's not wasted space. When you're being chased for your life, limping just out of the reach of an assailant, perhaps through the sunflowers or around the shed, you could decide to quickly jump down into a well, but it's no salvation. It leads you back into the basement, otherwise known as Leatherface's lair. The decision to escape to momentary safety by heading back inside the house is truly the stuff of horror movies. Rather than yell at the screen when the protagonist does something foolish, here you'll realize how necessary such a maneuver sometimes can be. The Labyrinthine Slaughter family household was reborn in intricate detail. As a horror buff, I admit I found it mesmerizing to move around that space. We can't see all aspects of the house so easily in the movie since usually people are running and screaming through each section of it, so the team has rather painstakingly poured over the aged film frame by frame to ensure the game's recreation of that space is authentic. The other day I told developers, hey I just saw approximately like 4 frames of the film, there's a light switch at the top of the stairs in this location, executive producer Ismail Vikins told me. And we'll go ahead and we throw that in there. The team is comprised of horror nerds, Keltner added, who described at great lengths to which Gunn included the faithful chainsaw audio. We located the make, model, and year of the Palin chainsaw, and we found 2 or 3 of those, got parts, rebuilt it, got it running, and then captured all the sound of that exact saw. <laughs> we hired Watson Wu, who is a world-renowned sound effects and foley artist, and were assured that we got the exact sound of that saw. These small touches are part of why Gunn has been in contact with around a dozen different horror franchise rights holders, Keltner revealed. Sometimes it's like one movie studio that comes to me and they send me a PDF that has like 60-something IPs on it, and they're like, pick one. And I'm like, that's not how this works adding that the team is meticulous with whom it collaborates, seeking partners who both understand video games and will be appropriately generous with the way that a team can use the IP. We have seen more and more of these asymmetrical horror games come to the market, but it's not how Gun Interactive is as a studio. We're highly selective on who we choose to work with and what games we want to bring to the market, and they kind of have to pass the sniff test here internally. Noticing and appreciating the game's finer details that have helped grow Gun into a horror name brand in a short time span will take a lot more playing than I've had so far, and no doubt more playtime will likely reveal pain points as well. But it's worth noting that while Friday the 13th was a fun, but oftentimes janky game, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre already feels much smoother with better controlling characters, more digestible objectives in UI, stronger animation work, and a much more detailed landscape. It all comes together thanks to the authenticity that I expect will excite fans like me who are always seeking new experiences in video game horror. A somehow still underserved genre. The first time I saw that infamous metal door or the red wall lined with animal skulls, I immediately felt like I knew this place that was, as a player, totally new to me. Faithful video game adaptations of other visual media can uniquely immerse players who bring with them a level of familiarity, and for me today, that means an eagerness to get back into that house despite knowing the horrors that wait within it.